I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Join me on a quest to find awe and wonder in all creation, human or wild, vast or small, spiritual encounters that move us beyond words. I remember this time we were in Florida on a family vacation. We were at Gatorland. There was a boardwalk going through the swamp. And Gatorland is a place with a whole bunch of alligators. And I was really young, and I saw some turtles swimming below the boardwalk, and I kind of hung off the boardwalk to try to pick one up. And my dad actually held my ankles and lowered me down so I could pick one up. My mom was furious, but I grew up just loving turtles and observing turtles and looking for turtles and hatching turtle eggs uh, and, and, of course, drawing turtles. And some of my earliest drawings I still have, and they're all turtles and dinosaurs. Matt Patterson has illustrated a recent book by Cy Montgomery, who is a beloved nature writer and frequent guest here on Constant Wonder. The book they have collaborated on is titled Of Time and Turtles, Mending the World Shell by Shattered Shell. I love all animals, but turtles especially, it really started getting really strong, I would say, in in middle school. I went to college for art in college. They don't have a turtle course. (laughs) <laughs> so you have to paint still lights and draw people. But outside of class, I was still always drawing turtles. And I just decided that this is what I wanted to do. And there was no plan B. I was going to be a turtle artist. And, and here I am today. On the off chance you should ever see a job posting that reads, Turtle Artist Needed, don't bother. <laughs> it's already taken. Talk about specialization. Matt is one of the lucky few in this world who succeed in landing a job that matches a lifelong personal passion. To call him the book's illustrator falls short because Matt's collaboration with Cy Montgomery was a whole lot more. These two turtle lovers have worked side by side over the course of a shared adventure, up to their hips in mud here, flipping their kayaks in the lake there. We'll get to hear about their joint turtle expeditions in a moment. But first, it's vital to understand how utterly remarkable these creatures are. The more you learn about them, at least in my own experience, the more astonishing they become. Turtles, it turns out, have an incredible capacity to slow down their metabolism so radically that time nearly stops for them altogether. You wouldn't want to hold your breath in a contest with a turtle. When it comes to heart health, they are of such a robust constitution that a 100-year-old turtle's ticker cannot be distinguished from that of a teenage turtle. Just imagine the implications of that for longevity. In theory, if this animal could avoid infection or other injury or environmental harm to its body, and given a reliable source of food, it could live indefinitely. There are many more characteristics of this kind of reptile that inspire awe, abilities that confound our usual assumptions of what it takes to be alive and stay alive, what it even means to be. I had already been bitten, not snapped, mind you, but bitten by the turtle bug myself before learning that Cy Montgomery has her name on yet another wildlife book, this time together with Matt Patterson. Among their many turtle tales is one about rehabilitating a young male snapping turtle named Chutney. Finding a turtle in Chutney's condition, most animal rescue clinics would euthanize it. A car had run over him, leaving him with a concussion and probable spinal damage. Here are Matt and Cy describing what they experienced while helping Chutney at the Turtle Rescue League, located in Southbridge, Massachusetts. Because of the concussion, he didn't know which way was up, which way was down. So he just kept spinning over. And every time, Alexia would have to reset his jaw. And so they they were trying everything to get him to stop spinning around. Alexia Bell, together with Natasha Nowick, runs the aforementioned Turtle Rescue League. It's sort of a turtle hospital. They tried weighing him down. They tried taping him down for some reason. Nothing worked. And then they came up with the chutney tube. And that was their invention where they stuck him in a, a plastic pitcher, like a pitcher you pour you know, water out of. It wasn't a complete straight jacket, this chutney tube. It had holes cut out for chutney's legs. And the handle acted as a kickstand, and it stopped him from spinning over. And eventually his world stopped spinning, and he began to heal. And when me and Cy met him, he was just about ready to be released. 
We were there for his release. It was amazing to see this animal who anyone would have given up on. And he was just fine. And he's living his best life in the wild right now. That's Cy Montgomery, a good friend to the Constant Wonder podcast, a prolific writer about all things animal. We'll be continuing speaking with both Matt and Cy in this episode. As it happens, the two are neighbors in New Hampshire. Now back to Chutney, the erstwhile spinning turtle, at the point in his care when he was sufficiently healed for release. His release happened after two years of being at TRL, the Turtle Rescue League, and They had this pond that is uh, hidden in the woods. It's really hard to get to. You have to get through a lot of poison ivy and and thorn bushes to get there. And it's actually behind the graveyard through the woods. And so we loaded him up in a plastic Tupperware container and we hiked out. And it was this beautiful pond, no houses around it. No people can really get to it. Like I said, it was hard for us to get to and we wanted to get to it. So it's a really safe place for turtles. And Alexia and Natasha picked him out of the tub and put him into the water and we all sat and waited. Because sometimes you have to wait a while for a turtle to decide to make his move. A lot of patience is involved with turtles. And eventually he started digging down into the mud and buried himself and that was, that was his release. Matt knew about Cy long before Cy knew about Matt. It was her earlier book, The Soul of an Octopus, that seized his interest and ultimately led him to reach out to her to see if he couldn't perhaps make a turtle convert out of her. Since putting their minds together, they've become fast friends over turtle conservation and rehab. When they first started taking field trips as fellow turtle watchers, Matt introducing her to some of his favorite haunts. They lived far apart, but soon they found themselves living in the same neighborhood. Here's Cy describing her personal awakening to turtles. Matt had read my book, The Soul of an Octopus, which is why he contacted me. And I started thinking about what would be the next book to which I would devote years of work to. The Soul of an Octopus took three years of work, and I'd done a bunch of books in between, but not one of these real heart projects that you spend years developing. And I was fixing to turn 60. So time was on my mind. And I'm spending time with turtles. I'm spending time with Matt. And I start thinking, who better than turtles to accompany me on a book that examines time, which, as you know, is one of philosophy's two hard problems, consciousness being the other. Consciousness was an issue that I examined in Solomon Octopus. So we went to this conference, which was at Turtle Rescue League, and we met Natasha Nowak and Alexia Bell. And they've learned to fix some really gruesome injuries that you'd otherwise just give up on. Cracked shells and brain injury and even severed spinal cords because they can regrow nerve tissue. And I began to think this would be a fantastic kind of through story if we apprenticed ourselves to the turtles there and the people taking care of them, that this might provide, you know, the narrative backbone for this book I wanted to write. So after going to that turtle conference, Cy and Matt decided they would pursue an apprenticeship, informal but intense, with a turtle rescue league. All the while, they had both been spending a lot of time visiting various turtle habitats together, sometimes moving about on dry ground, but sometimes on the water. We would go out in our kayaks, and we went out one time, and it was early April. We were in Massachusetts, and so you can imagine the water's really cold. And Cy fell out of her kayak. (laughs) It was a slow-motion fall, too, but she popped up laughing. So I knew I had found someone who I could go on turtle adventures with after that. But we would look for turtles. I had some secret places that we would go to. And and I remember on that trip too, I just looked over the, the side of the kayak and saw a swimming turtle and just put my hand in and pulled it up. It was so magic. And, you know, if you handle them gently, turtles don't freak out at all. They're just fine. And to see somebody like that, and have them favor you with their gaze, and be in their element, is just a holy moment. It's it's lovely. 
maybe just to test the limits of this new friendship and with a quirky sense of humor, Matt found himself hunting for a musk turtle for Sai, knowing as he did that it might make an unpleasant stink for her. Musk turtles emit a smell as a defense mechanism when frightened or threatened. It's an odor that has been described as the smell of a burning electrical wire. They're little turtles, and they have this beautiful yellow stripe on each side of their face, but they really blend in in the bottom. They really good camouflage. And one of the best times to see them is in early spring before lily pads and other plants start coming up and hide them. And so we were sitting in Turtle, I call it Turtle Cove. It's one of my spots. Finding a musk turtle there in Turtle Cove, Matt picked it up out of the water, but this particular specimen seemed all too happy, not at all disposed to make a stink. He was not upset enough to make the smell. He was so calm and confident in Matt's hand that he couldn't get him to stink. But that's okay. I mean, other things can stink for me. And from her tone there, it seems that Sai would have been unfazed by it. Eventually, she did get a musk turtle to do that electrical burning wire trick for her. Another thing that we started doing together was a, a, a friend that... I had met at another wildlife event, invited us to join her protecting the nests of five species of native turtles in back of this housing development. And you would think, you know, this housing development, there can't be any wildlife there. There can't be anything intimate and exciting going on in these backyards. Nothing wild or ancient, but not true. Five species of turtles, three of whom are endangered, were making their nests there. And turtle nests are at great risk of being destroyed. In most cases, 90% of all turtle nests are destroyed by predators. They're dug up by critters that will eat the, the eggs because they're full of protein. Even ants will, will kill these, these turtle eggs. Even tree roots will hunt for turtle eggs and send the thirsty roots inside the egg to suck the moisture. So every single turtle who ever manages to hatch is a total miracle. So these good people had decided that they would protect these nests by putting nest protectors around them. And to do this, you go out often at night and wait for the mothers to lay their eggs. And then you rush forward after she's done and you put these wire protectors around them that will keep raccoons from digging them up and dogs from digging them up and cats from digging them up. Sai and Matt were inducted into this elaborate operation of safeguarding nests by two legally sanctioned volunteers from the community, Jean Richards and Emily Murray. Richards and Murray perform their work in a MacGyver kind of world because you just won't find dedicated gear for shielding wild turtle nests on eBay or Amazon. There's all kinds of other accoutrements that we ended up adding and little curtains and roofs and things so that crows wouldn't eat them and the sun wouldn't bake them too much. Then during the summer, if there's a drought, you end up carrying buckets of water to water the nest so they don't dry out too much. And then when it's time to hatch, you have to check these nests several times a day because the babies can't get out. And when you check them and you find babies, it's like Christmas morning. And you take these tiny little babies and you put them in the bucket and you take them down to the river and release them there. And that's the most wonderful thing. And we had started doing this as well. It was really amazing. And, and they're permitted by the state. They're really devoted, too. One, one of them is a um, part-time librarian and the other is a retired school teacher. They will watch for turtles so they know where they're nesting. And, and Jean was actually, for hours, with binoculars, watching a rock, thinking it was a turtle, before she, she moved in to find out that there was no eggs. In fact, that wasn't even a turtle that she was watching and just patiently sitting there at night waiting. Being chewed by mosquitoes. Being chewed by and mosquitoes. And it's... You know, like Sai said, everything's after the turtle eggs, but when the turtles hatch, then there's a whole a whole bunch of other things that are after turtles. You, you'll get birds that will eat them. You'll get insects. Chipmunks will eat them. I mean, if you get them in the water, fish will eat them. Frogs will eat them. We've actually been releasing baby turtles and had frogs jumping into our hands trying to grab the turtles we were releasing. So every adult turtle you see is just 
has just survived incredible odds to get there. I have to say here, there is something Sisyphean about this in terms of the human effort. Uh, it's laudable, it's commendable, and it seems almost futile given the odds. How do you engage yourself, Sai, in this new activity, leaving the octopuses behind, coming to Turtleville, and spending time then with what is a daunting prospect of uh, conservation? Well, actually, the, at the time, when we ended up doing the bulk of our work with turtles and most of the narrative of the book takes place, uh, during COVID-19, during that pandemic. And that was such a dark time. And it felt like the whole world was broken and falling apart and we had political strife and we had environmental catastrophe. But to be working with Turtle Rescue League and to be working with our friends protecting the nests, it gave us a hand in mending the world. And rather than feeling like our task was was daunting, we were so grateful to be able to do something to heal this broken world at a time when so many people were despairing, at a time when everything seemed to be taken away from us, to be able to put something literally back together, a creature who might then go on and live for not just years, but decades or even a century. So each turtle that we were able to put back into the wild really felt like a miracle. Sai took part in this miracle right in her own home when, with a permit, she raised a clutch of baby painter turtles in her own aquarium, intending to release them into the wild later, of course. And she learned the hard way that even turtles raised indoors, safe from frogs, turtles, careening traffic on streets and highways, well, they can also be at risk, but they have amazing recuperative powers. Every morning, I would turn on their light, make the sun rise for them, and I loved seeing them look up at me every single day, and I would count them for sure. Well, one day, there were only three, and they were all named after painters, Monet, Manet, Bonard, and Surratt. Well, the other three were there, but Monet was nowhere to be seen. So I start taking the tank apart. I look under the filter and I look under the floating kale and he's not there, he's not there. He was under the floating dock and he was caught in one of the suckers that held the floating dock to the side of the tank. And he drowned. His little neck was all flaccid. His eyes were closed and he was pale and he wasn't breathing. It was terrible. And I screamed for Howard, my husband, to come down. What was he going to do? I tried to call Matt, but freakishly his phone was dead. But then I remembered something that we had learned about from both Turtle Rescue League and from Turtle Survival Alliance. We had seen it done at TSA. And this was something developed for sea turtles, great big sea turtles who get to be 550 pounds. But my guy was this big. It was turtle CPR. And what you do for turtle CPR is you move their arms and their legs until their heart and their lungs start again. And I did this for 45 minutes. And then I saw his neck move. And I kept at it. And sure enough, his eyes opened. He moved his neck. I righted him. And he could move. And he was fine. And after a few days in a, a dry tank, he was back swimming with everyone else. And that very spring, we let him go. I think rehabbers have a number of things in common. And one of them is faith. Faith that your actions will matter and that your actions have power. And the other is a willingness to fall in love again and again, even knowing sometimes your heart will be broken. But having faith that because of something you've done, someone's going to have another chance at life. And that's worth all the heartbreak. Like any other living thing, 
every turtle on this planet, in the wild, obviously, but also in the radically altered environment, in a suburb, in captivity, or in rehab, everyone faces daily risks. And yes, given the odds of survival, it's a miracle that any given turtle should ever make it. But it's also true that many a turtle has the potential to outlive you or me. As a hatchling, a turtle is fragile. In maturity, they remain vulnerable, especially because of automobiles. But in their basic anatomy, in their shape and structure, they are stout and durable, and even when damaged, can be pretty resilient, nearly eternal given the chance. Turtles are tough, and so you shouldn't give up on a turtle because turtles can survive injuries that other animals just couldn't survive. I mean, they can they can survive just catastrophic injuries. And in the rehab of our friend, Fire Chief, who is a, a big snapping turtle, he's a male snapping turtle, and 42 pounds, he's named Fire Chief because he lived behind a fire station in a fire pond. Every fall, he would travel across the road to his brewmating pond, like his hibernating pond. He, he would do it in a different pond. And he was old, so when he, when he first got there, the road was little. It wasn't busy. Now it's become a state highway. And so in uh, the fall of 2018, two years before we met him, he was hit by a car when he was crossing. And it cracked his shell, and it damaged his spine, so it paralyzed his back legs and his tail. So he, he turned around with his front legs and dragged his body back to the edge of the road. He rolled down the hill, bleeding, and, and the firemen saw him. And they, they loved him. And these are, these are heroes. These are brave people running the buildings. But they were afraid of him because he was a snapping turtle. And so they called TRL. And these two skinny ladies came. Uh, one of them is blind. And they found him in the water. And they took him back and repaired his shell. And by the time me and Sai met him, his shell had healed, his carapace. But his, uh, his back legs and tail, weren't. they were working but not great. So we got to do physical therapy with him. And we would spend time outside with him, walking around to strengthen his legs. So, you know, full gravity. We would hover over him like helicopter parents to make sure nothing bad happened. But we just loved like being with him. And he's a wild snapping turtle, but he's very unique and gentle. And he lets us scratch his neck and pat his face. And we really got to know him doing this physical therapy. And his legs started to get better and stronger every time. And eventually, he, he had a wheelchair at one point. Oh, wait, he had a wheelchair? Yeah. Well, so in the winter, we would take him out in, in the living room at TRL, and it's a hardwood floor, and he couldn't really grip with his claws, so he'd get real frustrated. So Alexia made him a special wheelchair, and she had to help our input from a whole bunch of people who wanted to help. <laughs> and we would put him on this little wheelchair so his back legs had wheels, and he would just slide all around, and he just enjoyed getting out and moving and it, you know it was enrichment for him and so it was we still have his wheelchair it was really it was really fun though and we really got to know him and we really learned that every turtle has its own personality just like people just like dogs just like cats and he was a very gentle kind turtle and he recovered from just a, an awful awful injury and he got better and he is he's king of his own pond now We're visiting with Cy Montgomery and Matt Patterson, the writer and illustrator team whose book is titled Of Time and Turtles, Mending the World Shell by Shattered Shell. We're going to turn next to the highly unlikely business of comparing two vastly different creatures, turtles and octopuses. That, of course, is a comparison that Cy Montgomery is very well positioned to explore, having written books about each. I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Embark on a whimsical journey with The Appleseed and host Sam Payne. It's one of many shows from the BYU Radio family of podcasts. Wrap yourself in captivating stories, expertly woven by talented storytellers. You'll hear live studio audiences taking immense delight in a broad tapestry of tales, some humorous, others poignantly reflective. The Apple Seed is always a family-friendly experience. It sparks imagination creative enough to make fiction feel like fact and bring real-life events back to life. The Apple Seed. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. 
Sai, Matt just mentioned getting to know what Fire Chief was like, almost as a personality, uh, legitimately as a personality, given your work with octopuses and getting to know their consciousness, their sentience, their personalities, their souls. Would you draw a comparison to what might be going on within the soul of a turtle? Yeah, absolutely. For me, the contrast was really striking and exciting. Getting to know octopuses. Here's this marine invertebrate who is so unlike us, you'd have to go to outer space to find something more not like a human. You know, they can taste with their skin. They can pour their boneless bodies through an opening the size of an orange. They change color and shape. Their mouth is in their armpits. They have three hearts. They've got blue blood. I mean, it sounds like a made-up space alien. And they live fast and die young. So I really did wonder... Could I get to know an octopus? Could I get to be friends with someone so unlike me? Could I read what an octopus was feeling? Could I even tell if the octopus was going to, for example, bite me? Could I tell if the octopus liked me? And the answer was absolutely yes. And the octopuses that I got to know, and I introduced Matt to some of them too, Mm -hmm. Um, The octopuses who I got to know absolutely recognized me, showed that they recognized me by looking up into my face, by coming to me from their resting area in a different area of the tank, coming to the surface, reaching their arms and their beautiful suckers up to meet mine, my arms. I lack suckers, unfortunately. And loving on me, playing with me, asking me to not just feed, but also stroke them and play games with them. That was a revelatory experience to me. Because when you know that the world is this alive and that we have so much in common, even with a creature separated from us by half a billion years of evolution, that you can be friends with someone like that, that just it blows your mind and it expands your consciousness and it cracks open your heart to all of animate creation. But what happens with octopuses is they break your heart. They have three, we have only one, and mine was broken over and over when my friends would leave me after only a year or two of our friendship. They only live three to five years. And when they hatch out, they're the size of a grain of rice. So when you meet them, when they're in an aquarium, they're already, you know, a 10, 20, 30, 40 pound octopus. So they've already lived two or maybe three of their maximum five years. Well, with turtles, that's not the case. And It's easy to feel a kinship with a turtle. They're vertebrates like we are. The only thing is their faces are not as mobile as a mammal's, for example. And they they don't vocalize to us as birds do. I mean, there's a number of birds that will speak to you in meaningful English. I have met birds that will speak to you in meaningful English. Some just like parroting our words, just like we sometimes will sing a song in another language and don't know what it means. And they just appreciate the music of language. But some parrots will speak to you knowing exactly what they're saying. Um, turtles, a lot of times we don't even hear their voices. They do have voices. But with Fire Chief, it was very, very clear to me. The first time we took him out to do physical therapy with Fire Chief, Matt lifted him out of his hospital tank. We put him in the turtle garden. We let him walk around. We would pick him up periodically and make sure he wasn't scraping his bottom shell because his back legs were so weak. He wasn't holding himself up like a a healthy snapping turtle does when he walks. And at one point, we put him down, and he was just sitting there with his neck out. And Matt and I, at the same moment, wordlessly, came to the same conclusion. And we both reached out and petted this old 42-pound wild snapping turtle. We knew he would be fine with that. 
Now, I would not try that with just any snapping turtle because they may feel threatened, but he did not feel threatened. He pretty much invited us to stroke him. We had had a good time together. He knew that we were looking after him. This is not normal wild snapping turtle behavior. Most wild snapping turtles will never ever attack you, but if you went to touch them, they would be frightened and they would gape, they would hiss, they might snap, and if you're not lucky, they might bite. I mean, who wouldn't? But this guy, who was perfectly capable of snapping and biting, because we had seen him murder a banana numerous times, did not want to bite us and welcomed our touch. Yeah, we we both just had the same thought. And um, we, you know, I remember touching his neck. His neck is surprisingly soft. There's skin, you know, and scratching his neck and his face. And it was just this wonderful moment. And he's never snapped at us. He's never even opened his mouth at us. Fire chief has been sent back into the wild or no? Ah, well, this is sort of the surprise ending of the book. But we can tell you that he does rule his own pond. Uh, he's king once again. Not the way we imagined, though. But we'd love to keep that as a surprise, <laughs> but let everyone know that he totally rules and um, he's a very happy male adult snapping turtle who will probably live certainly another 50 years, maybe 60, maybe 70. He'll live a long time. He'll still be there when we're gone. Well, when I'm gone anyway. Suppose he does manage to live several more decades. In your book, you say he's possibly on track to reach 100. That's a long lifespan, and so it's got me wondering um, about this. You say in your book that Fire Chief makes you feel proud to be old. You kind of give me the sense, almost, that it's, well, it's like you see him as a wise, experienced elder, somebody who has shown you the right way to grow old, somebody you can, you know, look up to. Well, you know, in our culture, being old is, old is terrible. Well, Fire Chief is probably my age. And as you probably know, I have a major, major crush on him, even though he is a reptile. <laughs> but sharing this characteristic with someone I so admire makes me appreciate how good it is to be old. When we're children, we're just supposed to grow and learn how to walk and learn how to run and ride a bicycle and drive a car. And, and then we're supposed to learn our careers and many of us marry and have families. And then you're kind of spending decades on that part of your life. But when you reach that senior stage, you have a new opportunity. And I was very aware of this. I finally have an opportunity to really devote more time to pursuing wisdom. And old turtles, they know so much. And you see this in other animals as well. I mean, who leads the elephant herd? It's not the 20 year old Tusker males. It's the old grandmothers. Who leads the pods of orcas, of killer whales? Again, it's not some 20-year-old or 30-year-old or 40-year-old. It's always an elderly female. And in a lot of cultures, being old is a good thing. It's an achievement. And, and I feel great about being 65. And God willing, one day I might be 75 or Maybe I'd be the first one in my family to make it to 80. That would be pretty awesome, too. The more stuff that you have been through, the more healing that you have accomplished, the more mending that you have done, that is just making your life richer and more beautiful. Given how much Fire Chief has come to mean to the both of you, 
it's got to be reassuring to know that he's doing well now. And then, then there's the idea that's also crossed my mind that it might be difficult, if not ultimately impossible, to feel any sort of, you know, what people call closure, if you're one of those who believe in closure. You have just sent that turtle right back into the world where it was injured in the first place. Now, I do know what you're talking about because when, when we release patients who have been at Turtle Rescue League for years, when we release the tiny babies who we raise up from hatchlings, that can be really heart-wrenching because you're not probably going to see them again. We don't put radio telemetry on them. That's very expensive. And there, there are turtles in the wild that do have radio telemetry, but those, you know, are funded by universities. And um, certainly Turtle Rescue League needs to use all their funding just to take care of patients and not necessarily do the follow-up of seeing, you know, how long they're going to live. A lot of times schools are invited to, with a permit, help raise tiny baby turtles who are then put back into the wild once they're big enough that some predators won't be able to eat them. And because turtles have so many strikes against them, it helps to give them a head start. And that's what this program is called, Head Starting. So Matt and I have been there while some of these school children released the turtles that they had cared for all year. And it's such a bittersweet moment. Some of the children would let the turtle go and the turtle, bam, would disappear. And sometimes the kids would cry because they hated to lose sight of someone they loved so much. But they were reminded again and again by their teachers and their parents that this was why you were taking care of them so they could go on and live their wild life and join their mothers and fathers in the wild pond. Cy Montgomery and Matt Patterson are with us. They are the writer and illustrator team whose collaboration of recent years has culminated in a book titled Of Time and Turtles, Mending the World Shell by Shattered Shell. This episode of Constant Wonder with the two of them turns next to powerful insights about risk, healing, and the beauty we might see in imperfection. We generally regard imperfection as unfortunate, but is there not perhaps a kind of beauty in the vulnerability and brokenness of living things? You make reference to the Japanese ceramic tradition of kintsugi and the idea, you know, the ceramics that are broken but then put together with, with a gold sort of glue. And there is some philosophy from Eastern thought about preserving and loving the, not just the broken thing, but maybe even the thing because of its brokenness. Yeah, absolutely. Just like the Japanese art of kintsuki celebrates the break and the mending, mending is an opportunity to create restoration, to create renewal, to be part of that. It honors the broken object or the broken creature for what it's been through. It honors the healing ability of the turtle to see the shell that marvelously, with help from people or not, comes back together. For me, it was a celebration to be able to take part in that mending, particularly when you look at a world that sometimes feels so broken. And it elevates us to be able to do that. I think also broken things can be very strong. Sometimes, you know, if you get, for example, Matt has a steel rod in his in his titanium. His titanium. He has I mean, a titanium rod in his leg. <laughs> yeah. So his once broken leg is now stronger than it was at birth. Stronger than my leg. And that's sometimes how we become strong through being broken than healing. And I think that's another lesson that the turtles have to teach us about healing, about aging, and about how we can mend a broken world. This does bring us back to a powerful word in the title of the book, Time. And we've already referenced time. And the turtles' teachings for us humans about time 
Uh, here you have a, a cold-blooded creature that as the weather shifts and turns cold, their bodily metabolic functions slow down. And here I'm talking about turtle hibernation, which is actually not hibernation, really. With turtles and many other reptiles, it's called brumation and is more a lethargic state than actual sleep. They, they go deep under ponds, and we learned from Gail Boss about the painted turtle's capacity to stop breathing. And turtles, when they brumate, some of them actually do periodically become active under the pond ice, and you can sometimes even see them swimming around under the ice. But many times, they are almost literally in a grave. They are, they are buried. They are unmoving. The slowness of this kind of life is kind of frightening to me, frankly, because I don't think of myself as wanting to slow down. It's a busy world. But the ancestors have shown them that there will be a resurrection, that they will come out of their graves in the spring and life will come back again. To me, that teaches me something about time that as I get older, makes me very happy. It teaches me about the kind of time that we don't experience with the clock and the calendar. It is not the kind of time that the Greeks called chronos, from which we get the word chronology. Instead, it's the time that the Greeks called kairos, which was sacred, eternal, renewing, cyclical time and connects me in that way to eternity. We're just starting to learn too about a lot of the miracles that are going on around us that we don't even know about. We, we don't know what their experience is like either. There was a recent study that really fascinated me that showed that even turtles who are brumating are not completely unaware of what's going on. They are somehow aware of changes in light. And to me, you know, this points to that there's so many different ways to experience consciousness, for example, that there are so many truths and realities surrounding us that we, we couldn't even begin to guess at. Okay, then, as, as long as we're talking about turtle awareness or consciousness, you are both fully persuaded that they have an ability to be conscious of us, that you can sometimes even see it in their gaze when they're looking at us humans? Yeah, we were at the Turtle Survival Center, which is run by the Turtle Survival Alliance. It's in South Carolina, and they have some of the rarest turtles in the world there. We're looking at this little Asian box turtle, beautiful little turtle, and then all of a sudden he looked up at us with this really beautiful yellow eye and it was such an intense stare and it it captivated both of us and it, that really got us thinking about how a turtle is focused and intense and you know knows what it's doing and and has all this information that's just been gifted to it you know through its ancestors i remember that moment so well yeah. and i remember that you and me who else was there? Was Clint? Clint, Clint and Chris. was there, and was and Chris was there. Yeah, all of us were waiting for this turtle, who was immobile, to possibly wake up and stick his head out of the water. We were waiting for minutes, and I felt so lucky to be with people who wanted to wait with me just as much as I did yeah, for the possibility of being blessed with that glance, with the gaze of a turtle, and and. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're talking about turtle time, too. Everything around us slipped away. And I don't know how long we were waiting for this turtle to look at us, but we waited and we waited eagerly. Yeah. You see people, you know, they talk about dwell time in museums um, and also zoos and aquariums and people like walk by the Mona Lisa, look at it and then walk on. They walk by the rhinoceros, look at it for a second and walk on. They walk by the octopus tank, the octopus is sleeping and they walk on. But you're really rewarded by dwelling there and paying attention. And even if the animal is hiding or the animal is sleeping, you're going to have a great reward. Being with turtles teaches you that that reward is 
coming. I have to ask a little bit about patience here, because if a turtle brumating is at some level conscious, then I don't know if a turtle is self-reflective like humans can be. I don't know that if they if their cognition has logic and reason, I don't know what goes on in a turtle brain. But there might be something there for me in terms of my own capacity to exist attentively no matter what the pace. Turtles teach us, for, for me, and I think you too, when we were working with turtles, they really teach you focus. That's the thing, I, I one of the things I got from them. It's because we're in a world where we have constant distractions, you know, cell phones and all these things going bing, bing, bing constantly. And when you're with a turtle, a turtle focuses, its gaze is really intense. If it's looking at you, if it's looking at a strawberry or a worm, whatever it's doing, and that's all it's locked in on doing. We would we would be so distracted, and all the stuff was going on, and then we would spend time with the turtles and everything would melt away and we would just be focused on them, like they were focused on what they were doing. And we called it we call it slipping in the turtle time. Turtle time. It's more than just the time you might take for a podcast about turtles. We should envy a durable creature that scarcely seems to age, that can slow its breathing and metabolism to a standstill, as if to cheat death of any power. But we moderns, we tend to be impatient hares. We are speed junkies. Whatever this experience is that Matt calls turtle time, it doesn't really mesh with time as kept on a human highway. Years ago, before I met Matt, before I started working with Turtle Rescue League, I was coming home from the airport in Manchester, New Hampshire on busy Route 101, and a big female snapper was trying to cross the road. And I pulled over, and she was so big, I. I was afraid to pick her up. I didn't know the right way to do it. And I was just so irritated with humanity. I felt like all these people, they just don't care. Well, I hardly had time to complete that thought when another person pulled over and then another. And they had the same idea I did. They saw the turtle and they wanted to help. And there was a lady with uh, her kids and there was a guy and the lady had in her, in the back of the car, she had one of those, um, it was like a, a sled. And we got the turtle into that and we pulled her across the street while the guy held the traffic at bay. And the turtle got out kind of hissing and snapping and a little upset because it was a rough crossing. And I thought, you know, she may never know what we did, but God knows what we did. And I frequently see people who stop and help turtles cross the road now. And it it restores my faith in humanity. It's really heartwarming to see the people who bring in turtles, you know, of all different walks of life, who who want to save this turtle that they found in the road, you know. And some of them will drive for hours. For hours and hours, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They'll and they'll want up. updates on the turtle and they're... That's right. There, the there, was, doing. there was one turtle who was so beloved in his community. We we called him Chunky Chip. Oh, would, yeah. But his, his name, name was, was Tordzilla, Tordzilla in his community. He lived in Marblehead, Mass. And he lived in this rather smallish pond, but everyone knew him. And he was actually a repeat offender at TRL. He'd come in with fish hook injuries twice, two years in a row. He'd actually been hooked three times in two years. And his people kept calling to see how he was. And when he finally was healed and released, the whole neighborhood turned out to say, welcome back, Tortzilla. And everyone was so happy to see him return to the wild. Cy and Matt have endless stories to tell of human turtle collisions, rescues, rehabs, and releases, which all underscore the big challenge we pose to wild things whenever, wherever, wilderness shrinks. Turtles have neighbors called humans. Humans have neighbors called turtles. Just beyond the guardrails, or just yards from the back of some parking lot, there can be this hidden Eden, this little oasis of wilderness where life for the turtles and the dragonflies and the lily pads is still going on the way it has been going on for eons and eons. Turtles arose with the dinosaurs. They survived so much. The asteroid impact 66 million years ago, they survived ice ages. 
But there's a question now whether they will survive us. And their fate is really in our hands right now. Because even though these oases persist, and we have to treat them with the respect that we would treat an Eden, because they're, they're magical, holy, sacred places. And that's what we hope our readers will, will feel when they close the covers of this book, that they can be a part of that, and you can be a turtle hero. All of the creation stories around the world, including the Christian one, tells us we have the same father, mother, creator, all of us. All of us are related. That story is told everywhere. We are all family. And I think that's great. I want to be embedded in, in a glorious, wonderful family, knowing all of these different creatures and apprehending their reality expands my reality, expands my joy, expands my capacity for compassion, just makes a wider world. Cy Montgomery is a naturalist and a prolific writer. Matt Patterson is a wildlife artist who specializes in turtles. They are the author and illustrator, respectively, of a recent book, it's titled, Of Time and Turtles, Mending the World, Shell by Shattered Shell. Our thanks to them for their kindness, their time, and their turtle time, given in support of Constant Wonder by being guests on our program. Today's episode was produced by Eric Schultzka with help from Mamie Teeples. Sound design was by James Call. I'm Marcus Smith. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio.